All right. So, as you just correctly said, my name is Anis Parshaus, and uh, I am a recent uh, PhD graduate from the University of Tartu. And in this talk, in this presentation, I will share with you uh, some of the findings uh, from my PhD research about the Estonian electronic identity card and its security challenges. Now, um, I think I have spent last uh, perhaps eight years studying, uh, researching this topic, so there are really a lot of findings and a lot of details. For this specific presentation, I have cherry-picked some, um, some key things, which I hope that um, you will find interesting. So let's uh, jump into the topic uh, right away. Um, so let me start by introducing the Estonian Electronic Identity Card. Um, so um, the Estonian Electronic Identity Card, or ID card, is an identity document that is issued by Estonian state. And why it is interesting to us uh, is because of this uh, smart card chip here, which is basically a small computer that is capable to generate uh, cryptographic keys and perform cryptographic operations with these keys. So basically, it is a um, hardware security module which guarantees that the private key exists only in one copy in the cardholder's ID card. So the private key is generated inside the chip, and if something needs to be signed, the data is sent to the chip. Chip performs a cryptographic uh, signature, makes a signature, and returns it back to the terminal. As you see, at least in theory, it provides uh, pretty good security features, so to say. Um, so in case of Estonian ID card, it contains uh, two asymmetric keys with the corresponding certificates. And the certificate here is a digitally signed statement which attests that this particular public key belongs to this particular person so that we could later link digital signature to the person who created it. Okay, so the first uh, key is the authentication key, which is used for authentication to e-services and document decryption. And the second key is digital signature key, which is used to give legally binding the digital signatures. Now, the reason why Estonian uh, ID card is such an interesting topic to study is because it is a nationwide electronic identity scheme, which was introduced already in 2002, and it is actually used in practice. Now, as you may know, uh, today there are um, many countries in the world who have similar schemes introduced, but as far as I know, in none of these countries, uh, the ID card is used as much as it is used in Estonia. And therefore, I think there is uh, a lot to learn from the Estonian experience, and also including the uh, security issues and the other problems it has faced over these uh, 18 years. Right? So, but anyhow, whenever we talk about ID card security, we have to realize that uh, this is about uh, much more than just the security of this chip and how secure the keys are stored there, right? Because there is this um, supporting public infrastructure, there is um, software that implements uh, these protocols, there is a legal framework, um, and much more, right? So, the ID card security has to be then analyzed in a much broader context. And all these things we kind of can. I uh, can describe by the term ID card ecosystem, right? All right, so um, let's just have a quick uh, overview on the ID card manufacturing and issuance process. So this is how it looks. So here we have an ID card holder, the person who wants to obtain the ID card. To get an ID card, the person visits the document issuer, in this case, police, Estonian police and border guard board. Uh, the document issuer themselves do not uh, manufacture the cards. Uh, this is outsourced. The, the cards are manufactured by the ID card manufacturer. For the first 15 years, it was Gemalto. Uh, for the latest generation ID card, it is a company called Idemia. Uh, now, the ID card manufacturer also doesn't actually produce the microcontrollers themselves. So these security chips are produced by a huge uh, um, semiconductor companies, uh, Infineon, which was used for the first cards, and then for the latest generation card company, NXP. But still, uh, the ID card manufacturer here is in a very important uh, position. It is a very important task because this is the ID card manufacturer who initiates key generation inside the card. So this is super important that this procedure is strictly followed because otherwise the ID card manufacturer could uh, get hold of the ID card private keys, right? Which, which wouldn't be good. Now, and then there is a certificate authority, uh, which is a private Estonian company, SKID Solutions, which issues certificates for the ID card. And here, um, the ID card manufacturer here is fully trusted by the certificate authority. At any time, ID card manufacturer can connect to the certificate authority and ask, please give me a certificate with this public key and uh, this personal data. And the certificate authority will digitally send the certificate, send it back to the ID card manufacturer. 
Then you can matter of fact, you'll write it into the card. Uh, the card together with pin, pin envelope will be passed to the document issuer, which will then pass it to the corresponding card holder. And it's also important is that to get an ID card, the terms and conditions have to be signed. And now, these terms and conditions is a legally binding contract between the certificate authority and the ID card holder. So there is no way for you to obtain ID card without signing these terms and conditions. If you want to get ID card, you have to enter into these contractual relationships with the certificate authority. And if you read actually these terms and conditions, you will see that the certificate authority uh, doesn't take any responsibility for the security of these generated keys. So it's all the ID card holder who is responsible. So anyhow, so this is how the ID card manufacturing and issuance process works. Um, now, over the years, the electronic functionality of the ID card uh, has been implemented uh, using different ID card chip platforms. Uh, by chip platform, I mean different uh, hardware and software components which are running inside the card. And figuring out which components ex exactly have been used in the ID card turned out to be a quite challenging uh, task because uh, this information is not uh, too well uh, publicly documented. But anyhow, so um, here you can see the image, the figure, uh, where you can see what platforms have been in used over the years. And you can also see um, for which types of identity documents they have been used for. And uh, so largely in Estonia, there have been five major ID card chip platforms in use over the years. This is Micardo, Multos, JTOPS LS6E6, JTOPS LS78. And for the latest generation of ID cards, this, they are provided by the Edemia platform. A few words about each platform. So this Micarta platform was introduced uh, in the beginning, and it was used for more than nine years. And now this, in, for this platform, the function, electronic functionality of the ID card was implemented by configuring the Micardo card operating system. So it was possible to create their key objects, uh, pin objects, and then configure the access rights for these objects. Then later, in 2010, a Multos platform was introduced. Now. Uh, unique, uh, this platform is used exclusively for the digital uh, first generation of digital identity cards. And now this Multics platform was a fully programmable card. So there, the functionality was implemented using low-level C language. And so some, some, someone was paid to basically implement the same fu functionality, the same card interface uh, as was provided by the Micarda platform. Uh, for different marketing reasons, Multos platform was deprecated later, and in 2011, the JTOPS LE66 platform was introduced. Now, this JTOPS LE66 architecture is this is Java card platform, meaning that uh, this platform actually runs Java applets, or Java card applets, which is a subset of Java programming language. Again, uh, here some Estonian was paid to implement the same functionality in a Java card applet, and the cards were shipped out to the, to the card holders. Now, in practice, uh, this didn't went uh, so smooth as expected because at the end of 2011, it was discovered that this uh, Java card applet has an unnamed security flaw. And all these cards issued in 2011 had to be recalled and the applet had to be fixed. Now, the next uh, milestone was at the end of 2014 when the upgraded JTOPS LE78 uh, platform was introduced, also Java card, which used a bit newer uh, security microcontroller. Now, as you may remember, this is this notorious platform which was vulnerable to this Infineon RSA key generation flaw, uh, Roca flaw, which was the cause for the um, ID card security crisis in 2017, which I think you all, all remember. And which was fixed basically not by changing the platforms, but by switching from the RSA key generation to elliptic curve keys here. And then finally, at the end of 2018, uh, the Edemia platform was introduced. And now this Edemia platform is also Java card. But here, this uh, card is not running some applet written by some Estonian, but it is, it is, it is running a fully security certified European citizen card applet, which is also used in the ID cards of other countries. And so what is important point to make here is that this Edemia platform is the first ID card platform which has actually passed full security certification. So for these previous platforms, uh, perhaps the, the chip or the operating system had a security certification, but not the smart card applet, which, is, which implements the electronic functionality of the card. And um, so the reason why Estonia moved to this fully certified, uh, certified um, platform is because of the legal requirements. So as, as you have heard, uh, the 
European Union EIDAS regulation um, requires qualified signature creation devices to be security certified. Now, before EIDAS, there was the European Union um, Directive on Electronic Signatures. It also recognized security certification, but um, as an alternative, the member states could do compliance security assessment themselves to verify that indeed the platforms comply to the security requirements of secure signature creation devices. And uh, as far as I can tell, uh, apparently the Estonian authorities didn't do this compliance assessment before introducing these platforms. Only in 2015, when uh, the EADS regulation was soon to be introduced, only then uh, the authorities re re realized that, uh, that this hasn't been done and actually we have to do this compliance assessment because otherwise these cards will not be recognized under EADS as qualified signature creation devices. Now, the status of qualified signature creation device is prerequisite for the digital signature to have this handwritten signature status. If the platform doesn't have the status, the signatures created with it also do not have handwritten signature status, right? And so what was done was that um, in 2015, a committee uh, was established um, from uh, four uh, state officials uh, who then issued the, the compliance assessment protocol, basically stating that, yes, these platforms comply to the security requirements of secure signature creation devices. And as you may guess, uh, uh, this uh, kind of assessment was uh, rather a formality because it's unlikely that these officials actually analyze the security of the source code of the ID card components. Um, now, and, and even more, it, it, it seems to me that um, for in some of the cases, for some of the platforms, the authorities may actually haven't found out what are the exact, exact, exact uh, uh, components that are used in the t into the platform. And uh, as an example, um, um, let me discuss this Micardo platform. So uh, while visually it seems that there was a single platform used for these nine years, while uh, communicating with the card, I got um, suspicious that there, are, there have actually been three different chip platforms used over the years for this Micardo platform. And I was also able to obtain uh, evidence for that. And so what you see here, um, you see here three ID card chip samples for, from the ID card issued in different times. And while uh, you can see that the contact layout of the chip is the same for all these three cards, if we turn the chips around and if you remove the epoxy layer and if you take a photo of the microcontroller, we can clearly see that these microcontrollers, uh, these cards are using three different microcontrollers. And the fun fact is that only this microcontroller, which was used in the ID cards issued in 2002, was security certified to be used together with the Micardo operating system. Um, now, I, I, I don't know whether, whether, the, what it, uh, whether the ID card manufacturer informed the authorities about these changes, but as far as I can tell, there is no protocol that, that would have assessed the compliance a security compliance of these changes to the requirements of qualified signature creation devices. And I mean, from one, from one side, uh, you can see the benefits of this approach because um, it's, it's very easy to introduce new chip platforms and uh, you can skip the, the lengthy and maybe time consuming uh, security assessment process. On the other hand, the, this even a formal compliance assessment is a prerequisite for the digital signatures created using these cards to have this handwritten signature status. So um, you could say that strictly speaking, uh, we could challenge the validity of any digital signature which was given using these, uh, these platforms, right? But anyhow, so uh, let's say step it a bit and uh, maybe, maybe you're you wondering uh, how did I manage to make a photos of these microcontrollers? And indeed, this wasn't actually a quite trivial uh, task to do. So the first challenge was how to remove the epoxy layer from, from, from the chips without damaging the microcontroller. And uh, this is where uh, the fellow... Uh, PhD chemistry student uh, came in to help. And what you see here is uh, sulfuric acid uh, heated uh, to 200 degrees. And when uh, this is done, then the... Um, okay, I'll, I'll ask it. Um, apparently one slide is missing. So when it is done, basically the epoxy layer um, is dissolved and we can get, uh, get, uh, get hold of the plain microcontroller. Now the next challenge, of course, was how to make a high resolution picture of that microcontroller. And um, so first I got in touch with the University of Tartu Institute of Technology to perhaps use their 
expensive uh, microscopes. But uh, then my colleague, um, Al Lopez, he suggested to try out uh, this um, cheap USB microscope from AliExpress, which you can buy for some $20, $25. And indeed, this, this cheap device actually worked uh, like a charm. And here you can see the results. So I actually ordered two of them. One with 1,000 times magnification, another with 1,600. And here we can see the results. Now, this here is this Estonian poem, which is printed in microprint on the previous generation of ID cards. So you can see, actually, that the zoom factor is, is quite nice here. All right, let's um, switch the topic a bit. Um, so in the context of my PhD research, I have also done a few studies which focus on a specific security aspect of the ID card uh, infrastructure or ecosystem. And the first, uh, which I would like to mention you here, is the research title Practical Issues with TLS Client Server Authentication, uh, which was about the use case where the ID card is used to authenticate to e-services. And here you see how it looks from the user's perspective. Let's say I want to authenticate to the online bank. I choose Estonian ID card authentication option. The certificate pop-up window is shown. I click OK. And then on the handshake level, a signature is sent to the server proving that I have access to the corresponding private key, right? So in the context of this study, uh, we proposed uh, different uh, tests, how to test the security of ID card authentication implementations on the server side. So we run different tests. We try to submit certificates which are expired, revoked, and then see whether they are accepted. Now, the, the, the most critical finding that we found in the, in, the, in, the, in the context of this research was that the two biggest banks in Estonia, uh, SEB Bank and Swedbank, that their implementations failed to verify whether this certificate is actually issued by the uh, trusted uh, certificate authority, which basically meant that it was possible to create fake certificates and essentially um, bypass the ID card authentication process. Now, um, at the end of uh, last year, uh, a computer science bachelor student, uh, Semyon uh, Kravchenko, uh, he repeated this experiment and he found uh, a few more e-services e where the same type of ID card authentication uh, flow is present. And uh, these were uh, KubeBank, um, Elisa, uh, Printing City, and uh, Arved.t. Now, this Arved.t was a somewhat a special case because it took uh, for them uh, more than months to, to fix this issue uh, because apparently they wanted to ship some also functionality improvements together with the security fix. The, 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 the other case which is noteworthy I think is this KubeBank case. Uh, and why? Because uh, KubeBank compared to other banks in Estonia, they are fully relying on the ID card authentication. So KubeBank doesn't use any uh, semi-secret user identifier such as Mm, username or user ID, as in case of other banks. So what it meant in this case is that the mass exploitation was possible, right? So it was possible to just take the list of all identity codes, go over them, see who has the bank account in the Kube bank, and then log into their accounts. Uh, what made the matters worse here was that Kube bank is a provider of bank link authentication service which then meant that by exploiting this flaw, uh, the, the person could be impersonated also in other public and private uh, e-services, right? So you see that uh, actually it may be a good idea to, to, to introduce some kind of user identifier because in this case, in case of these, these faults, the mass exploitation uh, could be at least slowed down uh, in, in this case. Um, if you are from Estonia and you are, then you probably also have heard about this latest incident where the hacker downloaded close to 300,000 ID guard photos from the servers of Information System Authority. And as far as I understand, actually, the, the, a very similar ID card authentication uh, bypass flaw was exploited in this case. And unfortunately, this uh, e-service of ID photo uh, downloading was not in the list uh, of e-services which we tested, so uh, we were not able to discover this flaw uh, before, before others uh, discovered. Um, now, the second paper which I would like to mention is about using the Stone and Electronic Identity Card for authentication to a machine. And this was co-work with Daniel Morgan. And now, this study concerned the use case where the ID card is used in uh, terminals to authenticate the cardholder. Now, for example, you see here example from the Prisma uh, shopping terminal where the card is inserted for the cardholder to obtain 
uh, loyal customer benefits, right? Now, what is super important to note here is that this use case doesn't involve any cryptography. So what is done here is that the terminal simply reads the personal identity code from the public personal data file, which is stored in the chip. And here the question was uh, how hard it would be to build a fake ID card, an ID card emulator, um, where we could specify arbitrary data in this personal data file. And so what we did is that we took a programmable Java card, we took a code uh, from Martin Paliak, and we extended it in a way also that um, this emulator, it logged the commands that were received from the terminal. So this way later we could see exactly which entries from the personal data file the terminal retrieved, right? And it's okay, so this pro project was a success. Uh, the ID card emulator was accepted as an authentic card in any terminal we tested. And uh, unfortunately, we also observed that um, most of the terminals um, in, in shops, they read the entire personal data file, although only maybe the personal ID code would be necessary to identify the person, right? And of course, we don't know whether this data is used somewhere or, or it's just that the API reads the raw personal data file and the system throw away everything except the ID code. Anyhow, so another interesting uh, finding here was that it turned out that it is quite trivial to transplant the fake chip to the authentic ID card. And here we can see the example. Uh, this is the authentic ID card, and this is the authentic ID card with the fake chip glued, glued on it. And also I was surprised that actually the process was quite trivial, and in this process, no sec physical security elements of the authentic ID card were, were damaged, right? So to remove the chip from the fake card, it was only necessary to hold a, a lighter a uh, few seconds behind the card and the chip would simply uh, fell off. Now, to remove the, the original chip from the ID card, you would have to make a cut somewhere here with a paper knife and then just uh, remove by force the chip and remove the glue residues which, which, which were around there and then glue the fake chip. Uh, so as you see, in this process, uh, it's actually possible to create an a authentic ID card with a fake chip that's visually indistinguishable from, th from, the, from, the, from the authentic card. Now, I mean, in this case, uh, you can see the chip uh, differences in chip uh, contact layouts, but actually today it's also possible to buy the chip programmable Java card chip, which has exactly the same contact layout as, as in the authentic card. All right, so the next thing which I cannot skip in the, in the talk title as, as it is, is this 2017 ID card crisis. And I think, so I have written about it quite a lot, others have written, I think it's well known what happened there, and uh, today I will not go into it. But I will just remind you that this was the case which resulted in a legal dispute against the ID card manufacturer Gemalto, because apparently Gemalto knew about the flaw earlier, but did not inform the authorities in a timely manner. Right? Now, what I want to focus in the rest of my presentation is on some of the findings uh, which maybe are not so well publicly known. And to set a stage for that, let me introduce the ID card certificate repository. Now, as you may know, all currently valid ID card certificates are published in a public LDAP certificate repository. And the purpose of this repository is to make the public keys available in case someone would want to make some, create some encrypted file to the cardholder, to the recipient. So over, over the years, uh, time to time, I have been uh, collecting these certificates which are published in this repository. And by analyzing these certificates, I was able to discover some anomalies which signaled about the serious uh, security flaws in the key management of the ID card. And uh, so these findings have been published in detail in the, the Usenix 2020 paper called Estonian Electronic Identity Card, Security Flaws in Key Management. And I'll just go very briefly over them and, and bring out the key, po key, key find findings. So the first uh, observation to mention was that there were certificates with corrupted RSA public keys. And here we can see the full list of certificates. Now, the corrupted RSA public key here means that these public key modules could be divided by small prime factors, three, five, seven, and so on. Now, as maybe you know, in um, RSA, the public key modulus is constructed by multiplying two huge prime numbers together, right? So 
if the public key can be divided by small factors, something is uh, really, really wrong with the key. And eventually, uh, we came to the conclusion that most likely the corruption happened on the ID card production line where the public keys retrieved from, freshly generated uh, public keys retrieved from the card, maybe on the electric communication line, and some bits got flipped. And when, even if a single bit is flipped for the RSA key, then it basically becomes, in a way, a random number, right? So, uh, now, this seemingly purely a quality issue actually tur turned out to have a quite critical security consequences, because if the public key becomes a random number, then the mathematical properties of the key are lost, which means that if we could somehow recover all the prime factors that make up the corrupted public key, we could also then construct the corresponding private key, right? And in the case of one uh, corrupted public key, in case of Svetlana's Bu, uh, public key, we actually managed to, to fully factor all the factors. And here you can see the process. So we used the GMP elliptic core method for factorization. So this is this corrupted public key modulus. And here you can see that the first prime factors are, are find, found already in the first few seconds. Then the next one, uh, and then finally, here we can see the full, uh, full, uh, full list of the prime factors. And it took us this amount of seconds, which is around 60 hours in total. Um, so yeah, we were lucky, of course, this, is, this process is uh, probabilistic, so it's not guaranteed that you... Uh, uh, basically, there is a bit of luck involved here, so I guess we were, 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 were lucky here. Now, once we have the, all the prime factors, we can construct the RSA private key file. And uh, then using the private key file, we can sign something and see whether it works. And uh, in this case, we see that indeed, no surprise, the digital client recognizes the signature as valid. Very good. So point proven. Now, a more interesting finding among the certificates were certificates with duplicate RSA public keys. So what it means is that there were several pairs of certificates where the public key in certificate issued to one person matched the public key from the certificate issued to another person. And this one pair, a pair issued to, um, belonging to Toivo and Ulle, uh, we decided to investigate a bit further. Uh, so here you can see the authentication certificate of um, Toivo, and here you can see the digital signature uh, certificate of Ulle. And as I'm switching between these certificates, you can see that actually the uh, public key modulus is the same here. And what you can also observe is that not before time that these certificates have been issued uh, with a few seconds difference. Right? Now, the question, of course, is how it could possibly happen. Uh, maybe it is uh, some flaw in the certificate issuance process. For, for instance, the public key, by a mistake, was included twice in two different certificates. Right. Now, an alternative explanation is that uh, the certificates are actually correct, but the corresponding ID cards uh, contain the same uh, private keys. And, um, okay, today I know that these cards actually contained the same private keys, but at that time that had to be established. So, but okay, in case, in case, uh, in case the private keys are the same for these cards, do you, do you see the security impact of this? So what it basically means is that the Ulle can create, using their digital signature key, she can authenticate as Toivo, and then Toivo, using his authentication keeper, then can forge digital signatures in the name of Ulle, right? And uh, so to test out this, uh, I got in touch with Toivo. Uh, Toivo agreed to participate in the experiment. So what I did is that I sent an executable uh, to, to Toivo. He had to run it on his computer. Enter uh, pin one uh, here, and some signature bytes were printed out. Now, so he sent me back this screenshot of this output. I wrote down bytes from the signature. I pasted them into a digital signature container. And indeed, this provided a proof that Toivo's card contains the corresponding private key, and it can be used to forge digital signatures in the name of Ulle. All right. Later. I also got in touch with Ulle and found out that the her card also contains the same private key. <laughs> but then the question, the million dollar question was how, how is it possible, right? Because if the, if, the, if the key is generated inside the card, it should be unique for, for, for each card. However, 
if the key is generated outside and then copied to the card, then in case of some software flaw, the same private key can be imported in two different cards, which, which actually was the case here, right? And this is when we come uh, to the finding the evidence that actually for some certain set of ID cards, the private keys were generated outside the ID card. And uh, to make a long story short, so uh, what we did is that we generated millions of keys using the actual ID card platforms and then compared whether the properties in the public keys obtained in this process match the properties of the public keys that are inside the certificates. And they should match if the same key generation algorithm was used, right? But for a particular set of certificates, they did not match. And here you can see the example. So uh, this is the distribution of most significant byte of the uh, modulus for keys generated by the platform. And this is the distribution you know, from the public keys in the certificate. And as you see, the distributions are different, which means that these keys were actually generated by some different uh, RSA key generation algorithm than the one which is implemented by the card. Now, the set of these certificates belong to specific set of ID cards which were, were renewed in a police customer uh, service point to fix the flaw in the ID cards that were issued in 2011. Um, so what it meant is that uh, the, the, the first, the person got an ID card with a, some unnamed flaw, and then when they went to upgrade or fix it, they actually got a, co a copy of private key injected in their card. Um, not very successful fixing of the issue, I would say, right? What's also super important to note here is that um, this practice of, of, of generating uh, these keys outside the card was present for a five-year period. This was done over a five-year period, and in this time, uh, none of the audits of the certificate authority, neither internal nor external, uh, found uh, this uh, non-compliance, which basically questions the scope and, and the quality of, of, of or the benefits provided by this type of security audit. Anyhow, so um, after we disclosed uh, these findings to the authorities, soon after uh, uh, PPA announced um, the replacement of the affected ID cards under warranty. And at that time, uh, from more than 74,000 ID cards which were uh, renewed in customer service points, only 12,000 were still valid. And then soon after, also the PPA brought Jamalta to court demanding a contractual penalty of 152 million euro for the breach of contract because apparently the contract required uh, the ID card manufacturer to generate the keys inside the card. Yeah? So this was breached. Now, in their public communication, uh, Gemalto uh, denied any wrongdoing. Uh, they said that it's a surprise, uh, that uh, PPA's announcements are a surprise and that they have done everything as, as agreed upon. And uh, now the latest news, which are from the February this year, is that PPA and Gemalto reached a compromise uh, agreement with Gemalto agreeing to pay the state 2.2 million euro in compensation. So 152 were asked, 2.2 were, were, were negotiated, agreed. And if we read the, the, the press release, which was published on Friday after working hours, then we can see that it states that the agreement has been signed to close the claims on the potential vulnerability to the Estonian ID card, which occurred in 2017. So as you see, this press statement mentions only the Rocket case, not the, not the key generation outside the card. I approached the PPA, and they confirmed, actually, that actually this settlement covers all the disputes between the state and the ID card manufacturer. And so you can only, only wonder uh, why uh, this press release mentions only the Roca case in 2017. But all right, so with this um, peculiar note, I end my presentation, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I believe uh, citizens have a lot of questions uh, regarding their ID card, so... No, I actually have a question about the slide 17. Uh, you said that you generated keys on the actual ID cards. Right. How did you do that? Very good question. Um, and there is a special story how I did on these particular cards, actually. Um, my, my Cardo cards, if you recognize, these are the first generation cards which were, which were used from 2002 to 2009. So in case of these uh, particular cards, uh, it turned out that this Micardo operating system was had a security flaw in their configuration, which meant that, I mean, I, 
I, I found it only after the last ID card was already expired, so this is not an issue, right? But if, if, if this was found like then 10 years ago, then this would be an issue, because what it meant is that by knowing pin 2 code of the card, it was possible to override the card management keys, which are used to personalize the card. So basically, I could just take a real card and create my own uh, configuration and generate the keys, export them, even the private private keys, export them and, 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 and collect the cards. Now, for the other platforms, um, mm, now, um, I got the samples for other cards for the Java card platforms. Uh, for the Multus platform, remember, the Multus platform, which was which had this applet uh, programmed in, in low-level C. Uh, I mean, I could get a blank, blank uh, Multus card and I actually acquired it, but the problem is that the key generation algorithm was implemented inside the applet. So for, for this and for Java card platforms, key generation was operating system feature. So there was no way for the manufacturer by writing an applet modified. But for Multus platform, of course, it depended on this particular application, which is not open source, so I couldn't get it and couldn't see actually what uh, what uh, what is the key generation algorithm which is used for Multus cards. Only by I, I could j so what I could do, I could um, um, actually just generate this plot, but I didn't have a reference data to see uh, what type of properties were generated by the actual card. So multi, about multi, about multi -os platform, I cannot uh, make any claims whether the keys were generated inside or outside. Uh, but for all other platforms, there is a quite strong evidence that uh, for all others except these 74,000 cards which are renewed in PPA, these keys have been generated actually inside the card. But here's again the question that um, how much can you trust the ID card manufacturer? Because to implement this key import feature, the applet actually had to modify to, to supply this functionality, right? So, and the same way the ID card manufacturer could have modified the applet to export the private keys after they are generated, right? So this really doesn't tell us whether there are copies of the private keys somewhere or not. Uh, that this is a trust issue here. Next question from here. Uh, hey, uh, you mentioned doing research with like Coupank and Arved and trying to kind of submit uh, authentication material that maybe wasn't valid, so to say. Uh, how did you feel during this research, legally speaking? Did you, did you get a consent before, or were you protected under something, or did you just YOLO it? Um, no legal cons uh, no consent from the parties involved. Uh, so what was basically done is that the, the, the fake certificates were generated, and uh, mm, we just tried to click on the button, log in with ID card, and see whether we are let in. Uh, and uh, now the question is whether uh, this uh, type of testing requires the uh, the consent. But uh, mm, uh, this is a discutable uh, object here, and I, I'm, I'm very much like should like to discuss these things. But in this case, no. Uh, well, we just went and tested it out with the service providers we considered um, important to be tested against this flaw. So I'm wondering from the human side that Toivo, you mentioned, like, uh, what was his first reaction when you reached out to him? Was he like, what kind of hacker are you? What are you doing? Or did he understand? Did he have any background in IT? Right. So uh, the, the case with Toivo was that, um, mm, of course, when I approached him first time, I approached him over email and I explained uh, to some level uh, the, that I'm doing this research and that it uh, would be very great if he could participate in experiment. Now, um, I didn't disclose to him that we will be forging a digital signature in the name of Ulle. Yeah. Uh, but, I but I assured him that this experiment doesn't involve any damaging consequences for, for his security. Uh, uh, because, okay, so if, if I actually did tell him that, you know, your ID card can be used to forge other person's signature, maybe that wouldn't be uh, the right thing to do, right? Um, but yeah, of course, I, I, I will approach him with most of the same credentials. Uh, I said that I'm a PhD student researching this topic, and apparently he, he deemed me uh, trustable enough to, to run this executable of this computer. But well, to be honest, we're running executables provided by different entities all the time, right? And, and uh, yeah. So maybe I'm not so rogue party to not run this. Yeah. A, f a follow up question uh, also about this uh, certificate collision, because uh, all those public uh, certificates are associated with a personal ID and they are published uh, uh, in the central registry. What is the probabilistic theory says uh, if you generate a certificate in chip 
what is the what is the what the, what the theory says how uh, is it possible to generate again two uh, uh, similar uh, certificates but now that reside on t different chips right right very good point so there has been a case in the history of this was about taiwanese uh, identity cards where the chips actually had a faulty random number generator and indeed there was a case that different cards contained not exactly the same keys but one of the one of the prime numbers was the same for these cards and indeed uh, this this uh, hypothesis was not uh, disregarded uh, from the outset that indeed it could have been that the that the, that the there's always a coincidence that two random numbers are the same, right? But of course, if the, if the numbers are large enough uh, and they're indeed random, then this probably should be negligible. This, as negligible as actually being able to just guess these prime numbers, right? So, uh, but what, what was, of course, very specific here is that these certificates were generated in a, a very close, a few second difference from each other. And as we later established that these are actually, this, that the common thing about these certificates is that they were obtained in the ID card renewal process, then uh, it pretty much pointed the, the, the finger that most likely these keys haven't been generated inside the chip, right? So that would be too much of a coincidence. In general, we cannot rule it out, indeed. And, but oh, well, of course, well, no, in, in, in some sense, we have a um, security certification for random number generators that are being used on the cards, right, and, and stuff. But in the Taiwanese case, this actually didn't help. So yeah, in general, it cannot be ruled out. But there, that, this is the reason why there had to be some, some additional evidence found, that, I mean, proof that the keys were actually generated outside the card, right? So we couldn't just... Uh, uh, kick uh, open the doors of the ID card manufacturer and inspect the li source code of the live system, what it is actually doing. Although maybe to some extent we should have done it. I mean, not we, but someone should have done it, right? So only we could do, we could uh, gain, uh, obtain some evidence using the public information, which actually was the case in this case. Um. Uh, thank you so much for being a watchdog on the Estonian government and uh, like technical agencies for like years and years now. And I also say that you are like a prime example of how mathematics can be used to actually keep watch of the organizations. But I have a question. Uh, Estonian ID cards were one of them, maybe the first, but now there are many countries who are doing similar projects. What do you think what is like the technical control level of those countries? Do they have like their own harnesses who are keeping tabs on what they do? Right, and, and I think this is really, really a good point. And uh, I mean, in comparison with uh, ID schemes in other countries, it might as well be the fact that about the developments in other deployments in other countries, we simply don't know that where these keys are collected and stored, right? But in the case of Estonian uh, ID card, there is some evidence that actually um, the trust model that we fully trust the ID card manufacturer. That we, that we enforce the security through contractual clauses because they promise to provide the security. This is our security guarantee. Uh, this, that this actually may not work always, right, in practice. And uh, what I also was telling that, I mean, no, when I started actually this research, and I was started to ask the questions, how are the keys generated? What are the practical security measures in place to prevent the ID card manufacturer for collecting the private keys of all Estonians? Then uh, pretty much the answer was, was I got was first answer was, there are security audits done, right? And the second answer was that uh, this is the business of trust, right? So these ID card manufacturers are huge companies with a billion whatever dollar revenues, and, and they most likely would never risk with their reputation doing something like this, right? And these both things uh, turned out to not hold in practice here. Right. So indeed, if to answer about the, uh, the developments in other countries, we simply, we simply don't know. But I think this is a good lesson also to learn for these ID card deployments in other countries about these trust issues and how much can you trust the ID card manufacturer. Uh, regarding the process, uh, as actually the state uh, must be in governance of the process, uh, how do you feel? Uh, is Estonian state government uh, like uh, been improved? Uh, can you see some improvements uh, regarding uh, uh, monitoring the security audits, performing the security audits as needed, and so on? What 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 is your feeling about this? Right. So no, first of all, I think it's actually a good uh, thing in a way that, for example, this Edemia platform, uh, which the latest platform has passed a formal and not so formal security assessment. Right. So that's actually a good thing. 
thing. Although even with that platform, there were some non-compliances that, that, that showed up. Um, now, has there anything changed uh, based on these findings? Uh, I, unfortunately, I don't, I don't see any fundamental changes in organization of, the, of, the, um, of these processes. Uh, but, I mean, but, but you can ask what, what the state could do, right? Uh, could, could there be a policeman with a dog, uh, like, observing this process? Or, or, or this task has been outsourced to the private entity. And also the security, in that sense, has been outsourced to them, right? And um, no... Mm, um, of course, the, the thing which I'm advocating for is to change the design or architecture of the solution in a way that the, uh, the, 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 let's say, using threshold cryptography as it's done in Smart ID, when the key is shared between the, um, the server and the, 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 the user's uh, mobile phone, right? So there can be uh, cryptographic solutions to decrease the trust level required for this. And I think this is the correct uh, way to, uh, to, to, to research further. But of course, this is not an easy, like, uh, switching the flag and, and, and running. This requires further research. And there has to be also, I don't know, political, non-political motivation to, to, to try to improve this. I don't know, maybe... Um, yeah, I mean, the really, really, really good question. You can ask uh, each of you. Can ask yourself, what would you do if you were in the in the shoes of the, of the state authorities? How to ensure it? And what I have actually in this research, I have, I got the feeling that um, the authorities actually do not want to even know what's how these sausages are made, because by by this knowledge, they would be liable to act somehow, and therefore it's actually very nice that oh, this risk has been. What is risk transferred? Yeah, this risk has been transferred. We have solved the the, 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 the risk, right? So that's that's yeah, how I see it. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> thank you, Martin. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Joke. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'll uh, hand it over here. I have a really easy question. Uh, which agency in the Estonian government is responsible? to ensure that those things are correct? Um, from the outset, uh, it seems to be Estonian Information System Authority. Uh, I mean, the responsibility for the, for the uh, ID card, uh, electronic chip of ID card. And this is somewhere written in the, in the government regulation. Uh, yeah. But, of course, no, I would say, actually, that this is... Uh, I mean, this, personally, I think that, uh, that, 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 that the, the fact that the private key copies perhaps are stored somewhere in some, some backend servers. This is, uh, I would say, the state security issue. Yeah. Well, after all, we are voting with these cards, right? So with these private keys. So um, yeah, that that's, 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 that's would be my answer. I'll also ask uh, one question. Uh, mm -hmm. You were already commenting on uh, how the things are done in other countries and uh, said that probably nobody knows. But has there been interest uh, for your work? So uh, is there a line of uh, different EU countries wa waiting for... Staying in a line, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, no, but uh, I think that's also understandable. Uh, the less... Uh, the less uh, focus, uh, the less probability to find something ugly there, right? So, um, mm, and yes, uh, of course, uh, I have dedicated a significant part of my life actually to research the Estonian ID card ecosystem and the solutions used here. And I would even say that I'm not actually interested to, to, to switch and look uh, for the, the, the security research outside Estonia, at least currently. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? We can probably have one sm short question. Yeah, there is on the back, I don't get there. Uh, hi, hi Ar uh, I have a question regarding this uh, radical transparency by Estonian uh, authorities. So uh, your expert opinion on, is it possible to create uh, cover identities uh, with uh, this scheme when all the uh, certificates are made public? Um, now, indeed, if you look at the Estonian uh, example, you can see that the all public, basically, that the 
population registry is public of, of Estonia, right, in a way. And, and indeed, if you see uh, in some other countries, like Germany, where they are talking about these authentication schemes, which will just disclose some properties about you, whether you are adult or minor, you know, and there is a, there is a big contrast here, indeed. Uh, whether I would... Um, be advocating for these type of privacy preserving authentication schemes? Most likely not, because they are quite complicated. And uh, what I also see from this research, of course, the complexity is, uh, is not always the friend of the security. So um, even if they provide maybe some nice security features, unfortunately, unfortunately, I think that the biggest privacy risk is what we, what we heard in the first session today, is that the, actually our data is stored in the servers, which are not well protected. That, that I see is a much bigger privacy issue than passing around your personal identity code in the authentication tokens.